Uh, it is uh, June 26, 2023. Uh, we are here at the Court of Appeals building on UNM campus. Uh, my name is Mike Bustamante, and on camera is Albert J. Al Reed. Everybody knows him as Joe. For his entire life, he's been known as Joe. So Joe has very kindly agreed to be interviewed for the Senior Lawyers Division um, archival uh, program, uh, so we can keep living memory of lawyers who have been in practice forever and a day. So, uh, a formal introduction, Albert J. What was Joseph? Joseph, Albert. yeah. Joseph Allery, there you are, born. September 4th, 1948 in Albuquerque. There you are, excellent stuff. Uh, and uh, so a native, you're a native of Albuquerque. The family goes way back, does it not? How far back does it go? Uh, we go, records we found go back to about 1739 in Santa Fe. Ah, okay. Is that your mother or your father? Uh, father. Okay. Okay. So, right, yeah, relative. Newcomer, that's only 250 years. That's right, yes. that's right. <laughs> Compared to some people, right? Yeah, the only, uh, we have Allereeds uh, both in Albuquerque, and headquartered in Albuquerque, and in Santa Fe. And when my paternal grandparents met and married, they represented both. Oh. He was from here in Albuquerque, oh. and my grandmother was uh, Fiesta Queen Court that year in Santa Fe, uh -huh. and also named Allery. So. Uh, excellent, excellent. She's always very proud she didn't change her name. <laughs> <laughs> excellent stuff. So she was lucky she didn't have to change her name, right? Yeah, there you are. Good. Uh, and you grew up in the North Valley, no? North Valley. Okay. And your house still there? The old house? Um. Several, yes, several old houses are there. Um, when I was really small, we uh, lived on the same block as my grandparents, uh, the Allerites. And uh, as I said, Twelfth uh, and or Orchard. Ah, okay. And then when we got our first family house, which wasn't too long after that, we ended up on Fourth and Douglas MacArthur in the North Valley. Ah, gotcha. Okay. Good. So, good. So you went to Douglas MacArthur for elementary school. Pretty. M I think till about the uh, eighth grade, seventh grade. Yeah. Okay. Good. I went to St. Therese just down the street. Oh, right, right, right. And then I switched to St. Mary's. There you are. So you finished up your early education with good Catholic education. Good Catholic, good solid Catholic education. <laughs> I was formed by the nuns. <laughs> There you are. Beaten by them, too. <laughs> you get wrapped in the knuckles very often? Oh, I... Yeah. <laughs> Your fair share, no? My fair share. Yeah. yeah. It seemed hard to avoid. It is very hard to avoid. Exactly. I mean, I think that was part of the scheme, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, they had very high standards. And they changed day to day, as I can remember. So, anyway. But they're always high, right? Yeah. I think the Dominicans at St. Therese were nicer than the oh. Sisters of Charity at St. Mary's. That's slightly ironic, isn't it? Uh -huh. That the sister and charities would be tougher. But anyway, there you are. Didn't be lacking in that department. So. <laughs> there you are. So, uh, so uh, when we were youngsters, youngsters all worked, right? And you worked for your dad at B. Rupee Drug Stores, right? I did. I did. It was, uh, What'd you do for him there? Oh, well, I was little. I was kind of just the cute prop. The little kids sell vitamins and stuff. Right, right. And when Keston Robbins was a big supplier, and they went and ran with that, so I was in, in a lot of their stuff. And then when I actually started doing things, I was in charge of ordering. The, I was in charge of the candy. Ah. So I got to order the candy, and then the school supplies. Ah, excellent. Oh, good. All right. Yeah. Some, some actual management, right? And then kind of, I was the sub when my grandfather or father both of whom worked at the store, couldn't be there. I would take their, uh -huh. their shift. And Good. Full-time management. 
Old time there, management. There you are. And delivering? Do you do deliveries? We did deliveries. Not anymore, right? That doesn't happen anymore. Well, you know, uh, not much. Not much. I live uh, close to the Madison Chest at 12th and Candelaria, and they will deliver. Oh, oh right, right, right. Uh -huh. no, that's a hop But that's, that's unusual. I, although, I guess now with the pandemic, some places went back to it and have oh, kept yeah. it. But... Yeah, no, um, I remember my father used to think it was very funny. He said, let's go. I said, where are we going? He says, we're going to Hollywood. And what he meant was Hollywood Street off Rio Grande Boulevard. And there. Ah, okay, good. <laughs> Sammy Collin used to deliver to the banks and uh, uh, people's offices. And I mean, you were just all over downtown, no? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and... Uh, we had the jail contract sometimes, so I do. We deliver to the jail. Ah, uh, good. When it was on the fourth floor of the courthouse, or before that? Before that. Even before that. When it was in city, what was the police station or city hall on second? Ah. Uh, okay. And the jail was at the very top. Ah. Uh, okay. Okay. We we had it sometimes when it was at the courthouse, but we started way back when. Interesting. Ever delivered any? Lawyers or judges? You know, I don't know. <laughs> Could be. Could be. Okay, good. I guess it wasn't young, in effect right. then, but. You were young. Did, did you know any lawyers or judges when you were growing up? Um, I did. I knew, um, knew a couple. Uh, one of them is your old partner, Arturo Ortega. Ah. He did work for the family, uh, both for the business and personally for my parents. Okay. And uh, so Art, when, and, and uh, our, my parents socialized with Art and Eloisa. So. Ah, okay. Um, right. That's when he was first starting his practice, no? Yeah. Early, early on. Early, early on. Um, so we certainly started at the uh, Bank of New Mexico building, but then we moved, of course, to 12th Street, to the Loveless Mansion. I know. It's the only thing I miss about the practice is that office on 12th Street. That was nice. You know, I got to, uh, I knew Jackie Loveless, the daughter, so I used to, I was there in, um, for social activities. Ah, there you in are. In the old days, when the Lovelaces actually lived there. Ah, there you are. So did you get to swim in the pool? I did. Okay. You know, that was the first thing we covered up when we took over that building. Yeah, well. <laughs> Need a parking. So. Yeah, I mean, there certainly wasn't a lot of parking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But well, uh, that's a, so that, all that building has lots of memories, yeah. including our talking to the security system to get us in. Ah, really? Some vocal thing. Hmm. You punch in a number, and they was, we would come on, and he would give them another code. And wow. Wow, okay. I don't wow. know what, how long that lasted or... Wow, but well, it wasn't there when we moved in, so that's fascinating. That's remarkable. Huh. Good. So, um, in high school, mm -hmm. you did all the normal high school stuff, a little sports, a little this, a little that, right? Um, football. Football. Uh, played football uh, with uh, you know, Manny Aragon was our quarterback, of course. Yep. Yep. And John Brennan, Ted Baca, those kind of folks. There you are. There you are. Chris Lucero. Good. Sort of all stalwarts or ex stalwarts of the bar, no? Mm hmm. <laughs> well, uh, we, St. Mary's had that coach forever, Babe Parenti. Ah, right, right. Right. And. He was there forever. Did he move on Pius after he left no. there? No, he never retired from there. Yeah. yeah. He was a legend. He was a legend. Mean old bastard. Yeah. <laughs> there you are. Well, but, had, had be, that's part of the job description, wasn't it? Well, it was. Yeah, yeah. it was. And, yeah. Yeah. You know, he'd remind you that he kicked your father's you-know-what when he was still there. <laughs> You're going to get the same treatment. So. <laughs> and he did. And he had. And, yeah. There you are. There you are. The good old days, no? The good old days, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you just mentioned four people who uh, 
uh, became lawyers, pretty prominent lawyers and judges uh, uh, here in Albuquerque. All in your class, I mean, any others that you can remember? And, and uh, beyond them? Mm. I don't think so. Not beyond them? Well, that's, that's an awfully good representation, though. How do yeah. you think that happened? I mean, was there something at school that, that engendered some interest in, in law careers, or, or it just sort of happened organically? I think i probably go for the organic happening. But, uh, yeah. we, uh, I think in those days, uh, there was a truth to the, the myth or the perception that you got a solid approach to education and to learning in Catholic schools or when it started up the Albuquerque Academy. Um, so you knew how to perform academically and... Mm. Gotcha. So if you had any interest, you had the tools. Right. And then people, you know, too, had another name, but he was certainly not a, a student at then, but Gene Franchini was a volunteer assistant football coach. Ah, there you are. <laughs> was he already a lawyer? Uh, he yes. He was, he was already a lawyer? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, we'll get back to Gene in a little while. You, you, you followed him around in the, in the career a little bit, didn't you? A little bit. Yeah. A little bit. In fact, one time we were, uh, I was sitting with him the week before I actually took the district court bench and uh, Gene was feeling nostalgic or something. He says, yeah, he said, we haven't come very far, have we? And he pointed out the window, of course, there's St. Mary's. <laughs> right, right, right. Block and a half away, right? That's right, a block and a half away. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's true. That is true. So, good. So, um, undergraduate school. Mm -hmm. You went in? You went in. Okay. Um, and did you live at home or did you, or did you live on campus? Mm -hmm. A mixture. Uh, first couple of years at home, and then the second couple of years on campus. Um, I did all the uh, traditional stuff. Uh, Student government, well, I mean, student government, student senate, vice president, student body, fraternity. Yeah, yeah. okay. God, that is pretty traditional. Yeah. So, so were you acting in student council and that kind of stuff in high school also? Uh, yes. Okay. All right. And in speech and debate and all that kind of stuff. Okay. I always liked politics. You know, my, my grandmother, my maternal grandmother, um, was a candidate for uh, Secretary of State on the Republican ticket um, more than once. And uh, so she used to drag me to, uh, to Republican precinct meetings. Great. Excellent. This is the 50s? Yeah. Early 60s? Oh, interesting. Huh? Very, very interesting. Yeah. So the outer reach stuck with the Republicans after the New Deal, huh? No, no, this, uh, these were the V-Hills or the tortoises, oh. my mother's. Oh, your mother's really, oh, gotcha. My, uh, the outer reach were, um, were Democrats. Uh, actually, they were Republicans until the New Deal. And, that, and then actually, a guy named Joe Montoya ran for Congress, and he persuaded my grandfather to be some sort of official in his campaign, either the treasurer or oh, okay. whatever. And my grandfather agreed, and the Republican Party in that, those days didn't like that very much, so he became a Democrat. <laughs> okay, then. And that was, so the Alarids were kind of Democrats from that point on. There you go. Kind of drifted on over after the disparagement. Huh? Fascinating. Yeah, the, uh, my grandmother, though, my maternal grandmother was a very, very committed Republican back in the days when there was really a difference in fiscal philosophy was right. the main difference between the parties. And, um, in fact, uh, there was a, a swearing in in federal court for a bankruptcy judge named Stuart Rose, I think. Oh, okay. 
And I went, uh, I had just gone on Metro Court or District Court, I'm not sure. And I was at the reception and I could feel this presence behind me. And uh, soon this booming voice says, he said, Agatha would be so sad. He said, not only is her grandson a Democrat, but an elected official. I turned around to see Federal Judge Meacham, who was a good friend of my grandmother's because, ah. number one, it was a small place, but, right. but you know, she worked for the state when the Republicans were in, and when they were not, she was at home. Yeah. Yeah. And Ed Meacham, you know. Right, right. Ed Meacham, what a character he was. Did you ever practice in front of him or, or no other one? Barely. Barely. Yeah, I dropped some, some papers for Charlotte once. Ah, okay. Judge Sheldon. <laughs> right. You can you can you know, disagree with me anytime anytime you want. To. <laughs> no, she. We got along well, but I only had one uh, one encounter with the judge. Uh, I was working for the state, and I had to bring by an you know, order for a signature, and Charlotte was not at her desk. Oops. And I was uh, too young and stupid to, to understand what that meant, like sit down and wait. And I went right in to Judge Meacham. <laughs> so he and I were having this conversation. I was giving him the order yeah. when Charlotte returned. So I think it's probably not, was benefit never to go back. <laughs> I'm not sure if, how I would have been treated. Oh my God. Um, you know, personal observation, you're lucky you survived. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> yeah. Fascinating stuff. Good. Yeah. So, uh, one completely personal note, you worked, you worked for the airlines for a while when you were in college, right? I did. So it was it American or United or? Uh, um, you're too, uh, too current, it's, it's TWA. Ah, okay. Which right. is, was, I think what was left was bought by American. Okay. But yeah. Great. TWA had a, an interesting program that would plant students on the campus and call them campus sales representatives. And you would assist the rep who had that account, whatever yeah, yeah. it was. And then the you'd work in various parts of the airline in the summers. Uh, worked at the airport, uh, at the counter, at the baggage, um, and the reservations. And then the idea was when you graduated, you would go back to uh, New York to 605 Third Avenue, I think is where headquarters was. And you, you started in a junior management position wow. with TWA. Wow. And I went to law school instead, but... Um, there you are. And I could have continued to be a rep for Georgetown um, back then, but I was a little too afraid to do that. I, I knew I could handle it here, but I didn't know if starting law school with some kind of commitment to a job would, was the wisest thing. So I declined and I just, just paid attention to school. I think that was a wise decision. I think so. I think so, that's right. Despite all the travel that you could do. Yeah, well that was nice. <laughs> <clears throat> was, sometimes you take a long weekend, fly to England for God's sake, right? Come. <laughs> Leave on a Thursday night and come back on Monday afternoon on Monday, or something. Yeah, what a life! <laughs> and even on the you know, during the week, uh, we had a, a flight from uh, Los Angeles, stopped in Albuquerque. It was half freight and half passengers. Oh, okay. they opened up the back and pushed out the passenger seats that were all on wow. tracks and stuff, and they would load it with freight and fly nonstop from Albuquerque to Kennedy at. Two in the morning, leave here at two in the morning. Oh my God. You spend Saturday, Sunday, and fly back Sunday night. Perfect. Or you go back to school? Yeah. Teach Little a life. play or <laughs> just play in New York. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was great. And, you, and the family got benefits too, so one, one year we, uh, we all went to Spain and oh. Portugal wow. on passes, I think. It didn't extend to my younger sister, but my parents and I. 
That's great. So, uh, given all those advantages, yeah, why did you go to law school? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I, I just never saw myself um, in business. So. Mm. Okay. Good. So. Good. Although I probably, I don't know, given the, the times, who knows how that would have worked out. I'm trying to think back corporate merger-wise and Carl Icahn's raiding TWA and stripping it for his own benefit, financial benefit, and leaving it crippled. And, yeah. Yeah. So who knows how? Yeah. That would have all been negotiated, but yeah. Not all the good old days were good old days, right? All the way around. Yeah. Yeah. So why did you choose uh, Georgetown as opposed to UNM? Um. Your old partner. Ah. Arturo. Okay. Because, you know, he had been, say, the families were close right. growing up, and we did business with with Art, and uh, when he heard I was interested in law school, he, in his mind, was only one place I should go. <laughs> he was loyal. And you know, Art, I mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, of course. He could be persuasive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so I actually ended up uh, having to choose between Georgetown and Notre Dame and UNM. Oh, okay. Okay, Notre Dame, another good Catholic school, right? Yeah. Um, uh, probably cheaper uh, than Georgetown? Probably. Uh, so why did you choose Georgetown over Notre Dame then? Uh, politics, government, uh, and, and weather. Uh, I mean, Yeah. You know, it's the first time I ever had to sit on an airplane while they chipped the ice off <laughs> so we could take off it was in South Bend. Yeah, winter can be <laughs> brutal in South Bend. Yeah. No doubt about that. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So were you sponsored by the senator? The senators used to sponsor people to go to Georgetown and law school, other places there in, in D.C. Were you part of that program? Or yeah. Or? Well, it wasn't really a program, but the, uh, the Capitol Hill Scholars, they called them. Okay. Yeah. And who was your sponsor, Montoya? Or Montoya. Something? Okay. Well, he's, he was a senator by then. He was a senator by then. Okay. Okay. Um, and he graduated from Georgetown, I think, in '39. Wow. So he went to Regis in Denver and then to Georgetown. Okay. Well, you know, I, I didn't realize he was that much older than, than us. He really was much older than yeah. us. Yeah. He? he died young. Oh. Huh. Oh, okay, good. So yeah. So as part of that program, did you did you get to work in his office, or did they, or did they find you work in other places? Both. Um, in my case, I worked um, on Capitol Hill the entire time I was in law school, yeah. and um, um, I was a member of the United States Capitol Police Force. I'd forgotten that. I'd forgotten that exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, any training? Yes, actually, we did. Oh, okay, great. A couple of weeks, maybe two or three weeks. Okay. In the great. basement of the Rayburn Building, or the fourth sub basement. I can't remember it. It was god awful. It took. Yeah. I got lost going to there the first time. <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> And uh, what we did, we had firearms training and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. And uh, I didn't qualify. <laughs> with the pistol? With the pistol, Oops. with the oh, well. 38 police special. But when I you know, went on duty, they gave me my six bullets and, and, <laughs> and gun anyway. Anyway. <laughs> which I was required to carry with me 24 hours a day as a sworn police officer of the District of Columbia. You're kidding. Uh -uh. Oh my God. So my little yellow Volkswagen had a 38 police special. Oh my God. In the glove compartment. <laughs> okay then. Uh, you didn't advertise that to people, I bet. I, no, I did not. <laughs> yeah, I did not. <laughs> I think you could probably shoot better than I could. That was one reason. Oh, there you are. It's um, astonishing. So, yeah, 
So how, how long? How long do you have that job? That's remarkable. Just a su just a summer. A summer. Just three okay. three or four months. All right. Yeah. Of course, it was a different time back in D.C. back then. No. Yeah. I mean, I mean, people could still walk up to the to the Capitol and just walk in. No. Oh yeah. Say hello. How are you? Yeah. And you walk into the you know even after hours the senators would come in and out with basically facial recognition. I mean that was it. Yeah. You know, yeah. Swiping badges or anything like right, that. Right. Yeah, that's good stuff. That's and uh, but yeah. Did you ever consider staying in D.C. and working politics there? I did. Um, when, um, well, I went to, uh, when, I were, when I was a year out of law school, or my, when I went from law school, I went to the Justice Department Civil Rights Division. And I was a trial attorney in the Civil Rights Division. The Title VI section, we were all divided according to the sections of the Act. Hmm. And Title VI was um, uh, federal programs. And so anything that got federal money had to comply with the federal civil rights requirements. So um, highways and and then uh, Texas, uh, even back then, thought they could get away out from under because they said they've already paid for all their highways. And Fifth Circuit said nope. <laughs> Supreme Court said nope. So that was the end of that. But we uh, and we did all civil rights still out of Washington D.C. because there was um, a concern that the act, act would not be vigorously enforced in certain states. And uh, so it was still all done out of Washington, uh -huh. Fascinating. which was always a rub with the local U.S. attorney. Yeah, because they're all politicians too, right? So, with their own agendas. So anyway, I would, uh, I don't know where we were going with that. <laughs> Whether you said it, thought about staying oh. in D.C. So after the justice, I uh, got uh, contacted by Montoya's office and they were getting ready for an election campaign and um, Bob Baca, who's a retired uh, U.S. attorney, assistant U.S. attorney here, called. He was an administrative assistant and said, would I come back to that office and work? And so when Montoya lost in 1976, um, I interviewed at a couple of other places. One of them, uh, Senator DeConcini from Arizona. Oh, oh interesting. But uh, then I decided, no. So I went back to justice, actually. I didn't come home. I went back to justice. Back to civil rights. My old boss was still there and had offered a position. Oh, wow. So hey, I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay, then. So back to, back to Title VI. Yeah. And, uh, and how long did you stay there? Another couple of years, I guess. Okay. Okay. Uh, now, uh, when you... When you say they handled everything, I mean, you were you were stationed there, but if there was actual trial work to be done, you just traveled out to to different states to do that. Yeah, and, and investigations. Oh, okay. Um, which made us really popular with some of the uh, the uh, FBI agents because we had a case one time involving the public assistance program and employment programs in the state of Connecticut. Believe it or not. Cause there were lots of Puerto Rican workers coming over from the island to do the tobacco uh -huh. harvesting in Connecticut. And so there's this huge non-English speaking Hispanic right. community. And there were issues with whether they were being treated fairly and all those. And uh, so we would go, uh, my first case was in Connecticut. United States of America versus Adriana Sanchez. Wow. Adriana Sanchez versus United States of America. But <laughs> Astonishing. We had a nasty habit in those days of, 
of being joined as defendants initially by the generally legal aid represented plaintiffs, the poor whatever group. And um, then we'd be in the case for a while and then if it looked like we, we but mostly the state, had actually uh, was liable for failing to comply, um, we would file a motion to uh, basically change sides. Okay. So we leave the state all by itself on the defense side. We move and help the plaintiffs huh. and prosecute the civil rights violations. Oh, great. That yeah. would change the complexion of the litigation, wouldn't it? It did. Yeah. It did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fascinating. So how many of those cases do you think you did? Not many. They, they tended to be big cases that went on for years. Yeah. yeah. Um, in fact, I was working in the Attorney General's office in New Mexico, and I got a call from uh, an attorney of justice who was doing some wrap-up on the case. Um, still, then, wow. this many years later. Wow, wow. Okay. Hmm. So, so at some point you got back to New Mexico. I did. Um, Why? That's, I mean, I mean the, the Justice Department's job sounds fascinating. So why did you leave that? It was it was fascinating, but I had always really thought I was uh, I was coming back to New Mexico. I, I never saw myself staying there. In fact, you'll probably laugh because we were in, I was taking a course from uh, Paul Dean, who was then the dean of the law school at Georgetown, and and he was the tax professor, and I was taking a state and gift tax from him on Tuesdays and Thursdays, which meant you spent half of Tuesday talking about Monday Night Football. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to spend a tax Yeah, class. I mean, he was, yeah. he was very much a very hardcore Washington fan and, and a football fan in general. Gotcha, gotcha. And one time he uh, called on me and he said, now I want you to imagine that you got this client and the client comes in to you and has an estate of six million dollars and uh, he has some follow-up tax stuff. And I raised my hand and I said, you do know I'm going back to New Mexico and I won't have any clients that, with six million dollars. <laughs> It didn't work. He said this is an exercise. Play along. It's so. <laughs> good. But even then I knew I was coming back. Ah, well there you are. Good stuff. And you know, uh, it, it became clear at, at that point you either had to commit to staying in D.C. and get locked into the lifestyle of that and the salary that went with it. I mean, it took a long time to earn here what I was earning when I left D.C. Yeah. So I thought, this is, you got to do it now or you're not going to do it. Yeah, yeah. You do get caught. Yeah. Otherwise, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, you ever regret that you, that you came back in any way? No. No, not at all. I think things went pretty well after I got back, so. Yeah, yeah, you did okay. Right? Okay. <laughs> so when you get back, um, uh, did you ever do any private practice or, or did you come back to work in the AG's office? AG's office. Okay. Okay. And who was the AG? Uh, Tony, Anaya. Uh, have you seen Tony recently, by the way? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, he does not look good, does he? Does not look good. He's not well. I mean, he has physical problems in addition to his blindness. Yeah. yeah. And then, of course, Elaine has passed on already, so that doesn't help because she was certainly a major caregiver the last several years. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I was I had switched, and we had a meeting um, at the Justice Department, the Civil Rights Division. And uh, J. Stanley Pottinger was the Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights. He was somewhat prominent during the Trump impeachment stuff because his son worked in the White House. Oh. And anyway, uh, we had a meeting because New Mexico had several counties that were going to come under the jurisdiction of the Voting Rights Act 
as a result of their statistical data on uh, on voting. And one of them, of course, was, they were mainly on the West, uh, McKinley, Farmington, um, San Juan County, Farm, okay. McKinley County, Cibola County. And we had a meeting in ju justice with the Attorney General, Tony Anaya, Secretary of State, who was Ernestine Evans, Bruce King, who was, no, Jerry Apodaca was governor. Ah, okay. And uh, Mr. Pottinger for the Civil Rights Division. I was there because I was from New Mexico, even though I was leaving. And um, Mr. Uh, Ernestine, the Secretary of State, was making a presentation uh, and said that it really was unnecessary. New Mexico had excellent voter participation. And uh, she said, as an aside, as she concluded, intending, I think, for it to be a humorous remark, that yes, she said, we have some counties that vote 120%, <laughs> which Oops. caused the Assistant Attorney General of the United States <laughs> to Oops. raise his eyebrow. <laughs> and for Tony and other people to scramble real quick to sweep that under the rug. <laughs> oh my God. Okay, great. <laughs> so, so when you came back, did you get your job in the AG's office? Partly because of that meeting. <laughs> <I bet. laughs> that was a kind of all, all set up, actually. Yeah, yeah. Fascinating. So they ended up representing the motor vehicle department, if you can imagine. So. <laughs> okay, great. So, um, uh, how long are you with with the AG's office? Trying to think. A couple of years, maybe. Okay. Dick Boston was my uh, division chief. He really? was in the civil division. Okay. Small world, isn't it? <laughs> Jill Cooper Udall was the senior attorney in that division. There you are. Yeah. Yep. It's one thing about New Mexico, what a tiny legal community it is, no? Very small, yeah. Yeah. And that was the days when the first district. Uh, Closed to everybody except local attorneys. I got four. Yeah. But if you were local and you knew, you could come around to the back and file. Yep. 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 Things aren't like that anymore. Mm -hmm. You can't even get in the Supreme Court building these days. Hardly during the day, much as after hours, like they used to do <laughs> in the old days, right? Well, that's right. I mean, can you imagine calling? Uh, I don't even know who the clerk. The Supreme Court is now. I think her name's Elizabeth Garcia. I think. But I mean, can you imagine but, calling Elizabeth Garcia at ten thirty and saying, "I've got something that needs to be filed by midnight. Can you meet me at the court?" <laughs> Rosemary already would do it. <laughs> yep. 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 Exactly. But no exactly. more. No more. Exactly. You know, it's a, that part of it's a different world. Yeah. No oh, doubt about that. So, no doubt about that. Uh, uh, so did you litigate around the state with the AG? Excuse me? Did you litigate around the state with the AG? Like uh, yeah, actually. Okay. Not much, but uh, um, the f motor vehicle department had some stuff. And then yeah. we also had the weight distance tax uh, for the truckers uh, okay. as part of that. They were kind of part of the revenue side of everything. Oh. Shannon touched up <laughs> And uh, so I went, yeah, I went around a little bit. Yeah. Uh, my favorite trip was going to Lovington, though. You told me a great story about, about uh, a case you had down there with one of the judges. What was it? Well, Fincher Neal was uh, the. Fincher Neal? Fincher Neal was the district judge. Then. Okay. Yeah, and, and I showed up at proper time like you're supposed to and she says well they're all back there having coffee won't you just go on back and join them apparently that was the practice in that courthouse have coffee half an hour or so one with the judge and kind of decide what the afternoon is going to be like there you are and then uh, so we go out into the courtroom and i can't remember if it was barry crutchfield or some 
senior member of the bar down there stands up and talks to Judge Neal and says, Your Honor, he says, we're, we're privileged to have a representative from our great attorney general here to present a case for this court. And in, his in, in the honor of his coming all this way and having to go all the way back to Santa Fe, I think we should take his case first. Well, that, so I thought, here it comes. <laughs> yeah. well, a little bit of sarcasm dripping, right? Oh, yeah. Right. Et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, base this side, I'm done. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, we went and presented the case, and Judge Neal took it under advisement, and the state won. But uh, it was definitely an interesting experience. Yeah, yeah, no, great stuff. Yeah. And Fincher? Did he serve with you in the court of appeals? He did. Yeah. He did. There you are. There you are. So, uh, at some point, you became a judge. How did that happen? And which court, by the way? Um, Metro Court in Albuquerque. Um, the legislature that year, I guess this must have been 1980. Um, established a Metropolitan Court in that legislative session that ended in March of 1980 to become effective July 1st, 1980. They were consolidating for all Class A counties, which there was one, <laughs> uh, what was it, small claims, municipal, and magistrate, and they would be known as the Metropolitan Court. Okay. And so they, uh, that law passed, signed by the governor, and they hired the consultants and, and all of that stuff, and on July 1, it became the Metropolitan Court. Wow. And um, I was, uh, a friend of mine uh, since passed, uh, Ray Showers, says, you ought to do that. And uh, we talked about it back and forth a little bit. I was working for the AG, I was general counsel for the Energy and Minerals Department in Santa Fe. Um, I thought it was gonna take some, some work. I mean, I don't know the bar in Albuquerque. Yeah, yeah. Um, and says, Ray says, don't, let, don't worry, I'll handle the bar. <laughs> so, okay. So <laughs> bar gets handled and I uh, am in a position as General Counsel of Energy and Minerals because of the energy situation to meet with Governor King pretty much on a daily basis about the price of the oil and natural gas at the well, at the burner tip, transmission lines, all that kind of stuff. And um, so one day at the end of the meeting I said, you know, I'm interested in, in this position. And he says, do I appoint that? He didn't even know. I mean, it was so new. Yeah, yeah. I said, yeah. Well, he says, we'll talk about this some more. And so sure enough, I, the appointment came up. Um, uh, I made it through the Albuquerque Bar Judicial Selection Committee, got through the grace of gray showers and yeah, right, right, right. Uh, whatever connections he had. And, uh, and there, there we started. And a couple of weeks later, uh, a longtime municipal judge here named uh, Ben Royball died. So they became, they created a second vacancy on the court. Ah, ah, okay. I think a lot of people were confused as to which seat I had, but I ended up with no opposition. And the one appointed to uh, Ben Royball's seat had uh, an opponent named Charles Barnhart who beat him in 1980. It was oh, a Reagan okay. landslide. Oh. Very few Democrats survived, right, right. even on down the ballot. Oh, wow. Wow. Talk about luck, right? Yeah. Wow. There you are. So did the Metro Court even have a building then? Where, where did it have its court? The municipal, uh, municipal court the building. Municipal court. OK. All right, all right, good. When you said it was created in March, effective July 1, I go, wait, wait a minute, how did it do that? 
Yeah, and I don't know, for some reason they uh, must have overbuilt because hmm. I, there was room for everybody. Everybody had their own courtroom. Everybody. Well, good. I mean, they were small. If you remember that building? It was yeah, 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 yeah. really tiny, but. And so I was there uh, for, as I like to say, 15 glorious months. Did it not turn out to be your cup of tea somehow? Yeah. Actually, you know, in many ways it was, in terms of, of being entertained at work, it was one of the most entertaining places you could work. Um, you had various types of client, of uh, defendants who um, would appear periodically. As they yep. went from city to city. Um, Almost a first name, first name basis. With one or Almost, two. yeah. Huh. And then you had uh, some unfortunates who uh, just couldn't get their life in order, and they were pretty much there every Monday morning. Um, in fact, to the point where you got worried if they weren't. Oh. Oh, wow. You know, you think, have you guys checked on so and so? Do we know that he's okay or whatever? Yeah. Well, that's, that's up close and personal judging, isn't it? Yeah. yeah it really is. <clears throat> and they used to have a, a tunnel between the jail and Metro Court. Mm. And they used to have no arraignments from Friday morning until Monday morning. Mm. So it was pretty ripe in that courtroom mm. on Monday morning. Okay, good. Well, there you are. Yeah, I mean, just, so I, anyway, I just, uh, um, Gene Frankini quit. And um, I thought, boy, I'd like to move over there. <laughs> I've had enough of this. <laughs> it's been rewarding in many ways, but in others. But not long term. So I called up to the governor's office and I said, I don't want to be greedy. <laughs> I know I just got an appointment from you, <laughs> but would the governor be offended? Would he think me presumptuous or overly ambitious to apply for that? The word came back, no. If you think you want to do it, do it. And uh, so fortunately, uh, Governor King appointed me to district court. Ah, good. Good, very interesting. So did you have to go through another vetting process? That same committee, bar committee, et cetera? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And Ray, did Ray handle that also? No, no. <laughs> this time I had to appear in person before the state judicial selection. Ah. And, and you know, uh, um, that was one of those committees that when there was a Republican governor, what, one lawyer was chair, and when there was a Democratic governor, another lawyer was chair. And I think Russ Mann from Roswell was a chair. And I, you know, I, I certainly have no firsthand knowledge of this, but I have a funny feeling that there was some coordination between the chair and the governor before the chair released the list of recommended appointees, if there was more than one. Right. Right. Which they didn't have to be because it wasn't. Right. It could be just one. Right. Right. And in fact, you know, the fifth district, uh, there was a guy named Don Hallam, who had been Speaker of the House. And uh, Don and I were up there the same day for interview to interview before the state bar committee. Right. Right. And I said, Well, who else is here from Roswell from the fifth district? He says nobody. I said, oh, he said, yeah, yeah, we always pick, pick our, in those days, our guy and send it up, and that's the way it is. So Don Hallam went up there with a sure thing in his pocket, and I had, was like the fifth or sixth of eight or something applying from Albuquerque. Yeah, 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 yeah. There you are. They still do that in the fifth, or at least they still try to. So. Oh, I know. <laughs> I went down there many times as on those commissions. And, right. Uh, right. Right. <laughs> they made it clear they were in charge. No. Yeah, very, very clear. Yeah, yeah, it's good stuff. Um, 
So, uh, that was pretty ambitious of you, actually, wasn't it? <laughs> it was. It's kind of cheeky in some ways, wasn't it? <laughs> it was. Uh, so how'd you, because you, 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 you're a person of, of few words, <laughs> and you're not demonstrative uh, in any way, right? What, what, what do you think um, sort of pushed you to, to call the, the governor's office and say, Equin, can you help me again? I mean, that's, that's interesting. I think, um, you know, Mexico and the Mexico politics and Santa Fe were real, I think, even small town even then. Yeah, yeah. And uh, given the fact that I had been general counsel with the Energy and Minerals Department and had that relationship with the governor and um, people pretty high up in his administration because our secretary was Larry Kehoe, the governor's chief of staff was, his, was Larry's wife, Linda. Uh -huh. So there was a lot of you know, personal contact that probably you don't see a lot of. Right. And so I felt comfortable doing that whole. And I thought I'd get the right answer when I talked to Linda. She would yeah. say, yeah, or no, it's not going to happen. Um, and Governor King was very, very um, interested in who, in, in whether his appointees were successful politically in the election. Mm -hmm. So I had already won. Right, right. So that was a plus. So he decided to go with the same horse for the Seneca race. And, right. Right, right, right. and again, no opposition. Now, how did that happen? For God's sake, how'd you run two uh, races in, in Albuquerque without opposition? That's because back then, uh, you know, that, those were plum positions. People ran for them all the time. It, it, yeah. Why do you think you 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 sort of escaped that that? Uh, you know, I really don't know. I uh, I'm sure it was uh, I'm sure there was an inflated mythology surrounding my political connections and whatever. I mean, uh -huh. I'd come from Montoya staff. Um, right. There you go. I yeah. don't know. So, so there, there's, there's some aura that you picked up along yeah, the way. Yeah. Right? You know, if you dug very deep, that would go away. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Right. And uh, I'm trying to remember who I ran with for the district court. I, oh, Frank Allen and Phil Ashby. Yeah. And of the three of us, only Phil Ashby got mm -hmm. opposition. Oh, fascinating. That's fascinating. That's a pretty good group. Yeah. That's a good group of judges. We had a, uh, our, fund rate, our finance committee was the AAA committee. Okay. What was that? <laughs> oh, yeah, right. Ashby and Allen. Of course, right. Triple <laughs> A. And uh, I, that, I almost missed it. It almost went by me. <laughs> it's good. Excellent. <laughs> there was some funny stuff, though, because sometimes stuff would end up in my office, sometimes in Phil Ashby or sometimes Frank Allen. And, yeah. Um, one time something ended up in my office. I opened it up and it said, uh, from a very senior member of the bar who shall go unnamed, just. just I used to tell stories about dead people that when they're not here to defend them, but this, the note said, Dear Phil, I don't know who this Allery character is, but you and Frank split this. <laughs> <laughs> excellent. That's excellent. Right? So what the heck? And, and you, should, you weren't surprised by that either. No. Right, right. of course not. I mean, right. How old would you be, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. That's Those were the gray hairs of our younger days, you know. Right, right exactly. These people. Exactly, exactly. So, um, so the, the the story about uh, Gene. We're back to Gene a little bit mm -hmm. here uh, about why he quit. It's always been a fascinating story. Uh, more fascinating, frankly, is how you dealt with it afterwards, right? I mean, to me at least. So, so why did Gene quit? 
Uh, Gene quit because he, at least I understand it, from him, but, um, because he did not believe in mandatory sentencing. Okay. And he felt if, especially in this case, which had to do with firearm enhancement, was the, if the district attorney had discretion, the trial judge ought to have discretion. And he refused to sentence this guy to the mandatory one year. And it went all the way up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said, the legislature has spoken. A year is a year. Do it. And Gene said his conscience wouldn't let him fulfill his oath and carry out their order, and he quit. He quit, yeah. And but part of his concern was that this guy... Clean record. He, he might have to go to the... To, that the prison to, to his prison, prison, right? I mean, that's and that was was that part of his concern or not? I, I, I think it was. It was, yeah, yeah. So because then he was coming in fresh with with no time served, and so it was a twelve month sentence, which was for the penitentiary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So and we all know a gross place that was, yeah. and a dangerous place for Dangerous. young defendants, especially. Right, right. I mean, not long afterwards. The riots, he said. Yeah. Right? All that. Just and then this kid was, you know, clean record, hardworking. Yep, yep, yep. So, so you take his place. You're now the judge in the same case. Mm -hmm. That's your problem, right? It's now my problem. And so, so how did you deal with it? Well, two things interesting about that is one, uh, Richard Traub was the chief judge in those days. And Traub came in before um, I really started working much. And he, he said, you know, you've got this sentencing up in this case. He said, if you want, I'll do it before you get here. <laughs> okay. That was nice of him. Yeah. Yeah. And I said, you know, that would be nice. But I think that would really not be the way to to get out of it. I mean, I took it with that, knowing that that's what it was, and I think if I was not willing to do it, I shouldn't have taken the job either. Yeah. And so, yeah. Yeah. so I, I kept it. And uh, so then I brought in the defendant for sentencing, and I brought him in early. So we had three or four days of time served, which took him under a year. So I sent him a work release at the county jail for the balance. I didn't have to send him to the penitentiary anymore. There you are. There and you we are. complied with the Supreme, with the legislature's mandate of right. one year. Right, 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 exactly, exactly. So, so a reasonable workaround. Workaround a it. Difficult problem, no? Yeah. Yeah. And I think it probably, you know, I mean, it would have happened if people had stopped to just think about it for a while, but the, the ball got rolling and the issue became the, the driver rather than the defendant, what was best right. for him and the system. So. Right, right, right. Yeah, I gotta say, I'm, I always love that story because it showed such, um, I'm not pandering here. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> that would worry me. It showed it, it, it showed a lot of imagination and understanding of, of what uh, the judiciary can do when it puts its mind to it. Yeah, right? yeah. The right thing with with the right outcome, uh, yeah. all the way around. So, anyway, yeah. So how long were you on the district bench? Two years. Two years. My God! <laughs> <laughs> well, you were a meteor rising, weren't you? <laughs> you know, uh, our friend, the late Pat Casey, used to <laughs> had some words about that, which I can't repeat because I don't speak Spanish as well as Pat, and I don't have the wit Pat had. But yeah, two years. Wow! Wow! Well, you were busy because did you have? One, did you have a death sentence that you had to impose at one point? I did. I had two death penalty cases okay. in those two years. Um, yeah. 
first one was uh, State versus Clifford Paul Simonson. He was a dock a driver, I guess, at Arkansas Best Freight. Mm. And then one was the uh, Jolie Compton who murdered uh, oh. Gerald Klein. Oh my God! Yeah, I remember the Compton case. Wow. Yeah. That, and in that case, the uh, when we went to the penalty phase, the jury did in fact vote for the death penalty. It's interesting that during that case, uh, the affirmance in Clifford Paul Simonson came down from the Supreme Court. We were trying, I was trying my second death penalty case. Oh, Lord, okay. <laughs> interesting timing, but, huh? Yeah, and it, I don't know how I ended up with two in a row like that. Yeah, wow. Was the court general jurisdiction then? So you, you took all, all cases so that just as they came? So as they came. The only ones that were, uh, we only, the only division we had was children's court. Oh, okay. But everything else. Yeah, that too has changed completely now. Oh yeah, it's all divisionalized now. Yeah. Can you imagine going from a from a landlord tenant uh, case in the morning to a death penalty sentencing in the afternoon, right? That's a that'll that'll flip your <laughs> your wig if you pay too much attention, no? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But you know that made that court, I think, really. Um, a lot more interesting because with the, you know, and I have a, a bias, I guess, against domestic relations cases. I just find those to be dreadful. Yeah. But without, going between civil and criminal, I think is a good thing uh, for job satisfaction. Right, 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 right. It's good stuff. So how that, how was, what was your personal reaction to, to sentencing those fellows to death and did both of them actually get executed or no not uh, the jury uh, declined to recommend death in Clifford Paul Simonson's case okay. he got life okay. um, and um, Jolie Compton got uh, was sentenced to death um, and I set execution date on his wife's birthday and he pointed that out, so I moved it. Although, as a practical matter, it wasn't going to happen on the birth date. Yeah, anyway, yeah. but it, no, of course, of course, yeah. Um, and Julie Compton died a couple of years ago, natural causes, in prison. Wow. Wow. So, was the sentence commuted at some point? By Don't, Governor and I uh, commuted all death penalty. Oh, Cases. Exactly. Wow. Okay then. So the sentence was finally taken, finally imposed, but not by a human source. Not by a human source. And he lasted a long time, didn't he? He did. He spent a long, I mean, it's a long uh, time. Yeah. I did, I did Simons and, I mean, uh, Compton just at the end of my time in the district court. Hmm. Is that 40 years or more? Yeah. Wow. I mean, Man. I think he... Astonishing. And so as far as I know, Simonson is still alive, but I'm not sure. Wow. Hmm. So if you were having such a great time in district court, why'd you want to move to the, the Court of Appeals? I didn't. You didn't? I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell me about that. <laughs> no. um, in those days, the court was seven. And there was a vacancy about to occur because Ramon Lopez of Algalores was retiring. Hmm. And um, Tony was, Tony and I was governor. And I can't remember, but I think the Court of Appeals was Walters, Wood, Henley, Donnelly, Neil, who was six? Was Sutton there? Yeah. Sutton. Sutton was there? Oh, well, Bivens, by now, Bivens. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. I think Sutton had just gone off. Oh, he just so, left? Yeah. Okay. So that was six non Hispanic judges oh, wow. Wow. on the Court of Appeals. 
Okay. And so Tony didn't like that balance or lack thereof. And um, he tried to talk uh, people into taking that seat. I was a strong proponent of Lorenzo Garcia, Santa Fe. Mm. It's already on the district bench. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And anyway, I'd end up taking it. We'll see. What, wow. What the heck? What? <laughs> wow. So you did almost as a favor to the governor, almost. Almost, pretty close. I mean, I, you know, I think I probably would have been set in good shape in this district for a long huh. time. Yeah, yeah. But astonishing. I did not know that. Okay. I, uh, yeah, I. And so I became seventh, and he's still the only Hispanic on the okay. court for a long time. Wow. Uh, so, so let me ask you this: the, the work of the district court and the work of the court of appeals is slightly different. Slightly different. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, did you ever rue the day when you left the district court? I did. Uh, I remember, I would say it took a couple of years before I was comfortable with where I was. I uh -huh. number one, I never. Uh, Aspired to write. I just, I despite. I mean, I wanted to rule on cases and deal with litigation, but the scholarly pace of the court of appeals was not what I was looking for. Uh, yeah. And so I, yeah. In fact, there were a couple of times when I almost <laughs> called the new governor and said, "Can I go back?" <laughs> um, Fascinating. It, it's com just completely different, isn't it? Oh, absolutely, especially when we weren't divisionalized. I mean, yeah. as you, in your example, I mean, you're doing a lien or uh, eviction or something in the morning and death penalty in the afternoon. I mean, the pace, the, you're every day. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, we sometimes, one time I had a juror complain because I think I brought him in at 9.30 to start to trial. And the juror pointed out, talk about being cheeky, that he thought we should use that extra time to do trials. Okay. <laughs> Keep moving. So I brought in the jury at eight o'clock the next day. Oh. And let him sit. While I did <laughs> sentencings and motions in criminal and civil cases <laughs> up until 29 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and then gave him a break, and then we started their trial. So that's what I do during the day. There you are. There you are. Good. <laughs> yeah. But uh, so the pace was to was totally different, which is great, though. I mean, you went from thing to thing, and yeah, um, yeah, yeah. as you know, sometimes those court of appeals files can sit there and mock you for weeks. Months. Just think, and months. And months. Sometimes and years. Before you yeah. Be able to get it out. I know. Um, so, and, and there's a social dimension too, right? I mean, there's the a what? Court, the social dimension. Yeah. On the district court, you're seeing people every day, all day. Oh yeah. All kinds of different people, right? And I mean, you're just busy, as one to one. Get to the court of appeals, and what happens? Phones quit ringing. Phones quit ringing. Talking to you. Nobody comes to see you. <laughs> and they went through a bit of a. A security uh, binge or whatever. I mean, it had been pretty uh, like the U.S. Capitol, where you wander in and wander around. Mm -hmm. And then I think there was some sort of threat against somebody, um, and it's on the Supreme Court. Yeah. And suddenly gates went up and something like that. I said they should just get a sign that said Supreme Court, second floor. But <laughs> Justice Reardon didn't think that was very funny, but um, <laughs> yeah, he wouldn't have a sense of humor about that. So I mean, besides, people just didn't wander around yeah. like that. Like, yeah, yeah. God, and then the commute. Oh, commute is dreadful. I thought it was dreadful. I mean, I did everything too. I, I 
by that I mean I took the state van, employee van, I carpooled, mm -hmm. I drove myself. Yeah. Uh, yeah. None of it's a good solution. None of it's good. No, if we hadn't established this office, I'm not sure I would have done been there that much longer. I mean, some people did it 18, 20 years. I, I just can't, I can't imagine. Yeah, I can't imagine either. I cannot imagine. Uh, so, so tell me a little bit about the dynamics of the court. Uh, you know, when I came on, uh, the court was pretty settled. I mean, systems were in good shape, et cetera, et cetera. When you came on, uh, things were a little unsettled, right? I mean, the, the court had been in kind of turmoil before you got there, right? And, how did, how did all that uh, affect the, your early years and how, how that happened? You know, I'm, I'm not... I'm not sure, but let me say, let me say this, uh, that I think for collegiality and the ability of, of different sides to work together uh, that all was enhanced by the appointment of Pam Minzner. Um, there had certainly been some friction with former members of the Court of Appeals, but when they went, left the court and went to the Supreme Court, um, some of that went away. And Pam and I were pretty easy to get along with. Ah, good. And good. Pam had a just a sixth sense, I think, a, almost a healing presence, you know. Right, right, right. So I give I give her a lot of credit for that. Yeah, there you are. Did uh, did, she, did she replace Mary? She replaced Mary. Okay. Mary had a slightly different personality, didn't she? A little different. <laughs> A little different. <laughs> Need me say more? <laughs> I, don't um, so <laughs> I remember I got invited to go up to um, Judge Lopez's farewell lunch, and uh, so I go. I, my secretary, uh, who had been Jean's secretary, Maggie, went to Santa Fe with me, and uh, she didn't last very long up there. She. Didn't like the commute, which I don't blame her. I, mean, I didn't like it either. And she didn't like the isolation. Much more social person. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but we were up there for the lunch. And Mary said, do you stop by my office? She was chief. And on your way, before you leave. And I said, sure. And, you know, this is, I have like three and a half or four weeks left on the district court. And there are the files of my cases from the next month on the Court of Appeals. It says, here's your cases for next month. You can take them with you. <laughs> yeah, like, when am I going to have five seconds to deal with those cases? I'm trying to wrap up a docket. No. Right, right, right. <laughs> but anyway. I love that. So. Stop being a district judge on a Friday. <laughs> Get your ass up here on Monday and start working on these cases, right? Yeah. Uh, that's great stuff. Wow. Yeah, that's great. Anyway. Those were days like Joe, Joe Wood, who was obviously the most senior, I think, at that point. Uh, cases would be assigned on, say, Monday. And by the next Monday or Tuesday, if you weren't circulating cases, he would call. Wow. And ask if you had any problems. Wow. Have any problem with any of those cases? Wow. Circulating like draft opinions already? Good <laughs> Lord. <laughs> it's a good thing I didn't come on the court that day. I'd have washed out <laughs> with that kind of pressure. Wow. Okay, well there you are. So it's a different it was yeah, a different place. And we'll talk about it, I mean he, Talk about shepherds and those kinds of services now being yeah. all online and, and available. You didn't need any of that stuff. Joe Wood knew them. I mean, he, he would say, oh, yeah, 
We had that issue with, if you look at 91 New Mexico, I think page 675. Yeah. Is that the case? Yeah. And you'd be pretty close, wouldn't you? If not the exact, yeah. right there. Yeah, I know. I know. Art used to do that to us also. Did he? When I was a young lawyer, yeah. There was a case. Uh, anyway, so. And, uh, well, I saw Wood do it once in oral argument. I was I was on a panel with him, and he said uh, to the lawyer, he said, "You know, Judge Allery uh, had an opinion in the bar bulletin last week." Yeah. <laughs> uh, <I> did <laughs> you didn't know it had been bar bulletin? Probably, right? <laughs> probably not. Yeah. I That's certainly didn't stuff. know the. See immediately the connection between that case and the one we were hearing at the yeah. time. Astonishing. It's just astonishing. But did you have to run an election on the Court of Appeals? I did. Uh, contested or did you? Did you I was uncontested it? again. Um, <laughs> wow. Okay then. I ran with um, Tom Donnelly. His seat was up at that time. Okay. And my seat was up at that time. Neither one of us had primary or general election opposition. That's the way to get elected, no? It's the only way to run. Was that the last election you ran? Did, did retention come in after that, or did you? I think I had one more. Did you? But Again, uncontested? Uncontested, yeah. I've never had a, never had a contested election. <laughs> As opposed to Judge Baca. Yeah. <laughs> Used to, how many contested elections did he have down here in, as a district judge? Oh, I know. Like I don't eight know. Eight or ten or something? I mean, it's just astonishing, no? Anyway. Yeah. Anyway. I Yeah, I just, who knows? I mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty remarkable. So that's, you know, that running an uncontested election, again, that's just serendipity, right? I mean, it really is. Wow. Because by the last one, whatever aura you had, uh, you know, from the prior connections, had to evaporate at that point, right? I mean, as a court of appeals judge, hell, half the people you knew had forgotten you you were alive, probably. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, we had a, we, uh, I think the politics certainly worked out well. I don't know why, if, whether it was my experience with Tony Anaya's campaign, or I was his campaign manager, or uh, when he ran against Pete. Domenici, uh -huh. right, right. and nearly beat him. So right. Nearly, right. Nearly, right. but you know, close doesn't count. And uh, but because when I ran, uh, I was advised early to uh, get a strong representative lawyers committee. Uh -huh. So I had Raymond Sanchez, Gene Samberson. Walter Martinez. <clears throat> so three speakers of the house, former speakers of the house, right, right. and a load of other lawyers. Maybe you, I don't know. Yeah. <clears throat> I certainly had art, but right. whether he took care of the firm or not, I don't know. Uh, you know that I remember you coming into the office one time uh, to talk about a campaign. I don't know which one it was, uh, but you know. Mark was there, and the rest of us were there. So, <laughs> <'Cause>, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> he, was the man. he was the man. So we had a great uh, committee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All over the state, and uh, that's great. I understand that there was uh, somebody who was contemplating a primary challenge, and whoever they were talking to had received the letter from the committee and they handed them the letter and said, you ready to take this on? And they went you know, up to one side and all the way down the other. And as I say, had the three speakers from right. certainly different factions in the, in the party itself. And right, right, right. Stuff and the right. person decided that. Yeah. That Not wouldn't stop, that doesn't stop people today, but it did then. Yeah. No, not this one. I mean, yeah, with those three speakers, you, you basically covered 
the party at that point. Yeah. I mean, the, all all the factions of the party were covered. So. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's great. Pretty you know, and had good some good support. I mean, um, Bill Sneed and Bill Carpenter came in to visit. Yeah. There you are. So. There's the trial lawyers part of it, right? So. There you are. Uh, uh, did you ever get used to, back to the, the difference of your daily life as a district judge versus a court of appeals judge, did you ever get to, uh, used to, and in fact enjoy sort of the anonymity, the quiet of the court of appeals life, or, or did that always sort of rankle when you took care of it on your personal life? <laughs> <laughs> um. I think I grew to appreciate yeah. not having to worry if you were the TV show of the week or, or not. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's good. But you know, we're per even on the district bench, except for the fact, when, except for those cases which end up getting uh, special media coverage, we're pretty anonymous anyway. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly, exactly. And and back then, there, there wasn't the media, uh, you know, all the ways to say stupid things that people will see yes. <laughs> that there are now, right? <laughs> so, yeah, so it was, it was, you had to work hard, really hard to get anybody's attention back. We had some great journalists, and uh, we had Bill Feather for the wire service up in Santa Fe, and we had uh, Suzanne Burks down here in Albuquerque. And yeah. And uh, uh, Michael Herley, um, people who were conscientious and smart. Right. right, right. In fact, I don't know how many typos Bill Feather picked up before the opinions went out, but he was there first thing in the morning when opinions were filed, uh, and he would go through them, every yeah. one of them. Wow. Every day. Wow. And sometimes he'd come in and he'd say, You know, on this line here on this page, you got to. <laughs> Change Thank you. Full page. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. It's good stuff. Excellent. Yeah. You just don't we don't have that kind of yeah. journalism anymore. Yeah. Yeah. No, we certainly don't. Um, so you wound up spending a full 24 years on the Court of Appeals. 20. Did you? 25. 20, 25 years. Yeah, because Ramon quit a year early. Ah. Uh -huh. It wasn't going to be the natural end of his term. Ah, uh, okay. So I had one. Plus three. Gotcha. Okay. Wow. So okay. 25 is full. Sorry. So is that the longest? Anybody else stay longer? My understanding is not. I'm the longest serving, and the second one, longest serving is Jim, Jim Wexler. Ah, okay. All right. There you are. It's good. It's a record. It's good stuff. It is a record. In fact, you know, uh, Dick Minzner is a, a student of New Mexico political history. And Dick Minzner, when I was finishing up, he said, you know, congratulations. I said, what for? He said, he says, as of the day you resign, you will be the longest serving statewide elected official ever in the state of New Mexico. Wow. Wow. Okay. Now, and you should think about it because, of course, Senator Domenici served more than that in the Senate. Right. right. But he wasn't a state official. Right. 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 So anyway, right. that's what Dick Minzner tells me. <laughs> okay. Good. Good. Now, I always believe Dick Minzner. No, it's, it's a good idea to believe Dick. Yeah. He says things like that. Exactly. Exactly. So, uh, any cases that stand out for you on the on the court of appeals that really sort of made an impression, or really really hard, or, or whatever? Yeah, there was a case. Um, I believe it was Armijo versus the Board of Regents, the University of New Mexico. It was a medical malpractice case in which a a woman presented uh, for a bilateral tubal ligation. Okay. okay. 
And this, UNM did the surgery, and the re person doing the surgery was a resident. And the resident, apparently not unusually in these surgeries, was unable to locate both tubes. Oops. That happens. The problem here is they never told the patient. Oops. And the evidence was, in the case was the, the, the uh, this was a family on the edge financially and everything fell apart with, with the new kid. I mean, just everything fell apart. Marriage, finance, that whole thing. So they sued, and the conventional, the majority rule in those days was that you couldn't sue, recover for the birth of a healthy child. The presence of that bundle of joy and new life was canceled everything else out. You couldn't possibly recover if the baby had been had some defect, different story. Maybe then, maybe then right? Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, Bill Bivens and I battled on that, and um, I worked with one of our pre-hearing attorneys, um, Marsha. Oh yeah, yeah, Marsha. Kendra Dipper last night. Yeah, me either. Anyway, she was basically my clerk on that case. And, and uh, she and I, and, and then uh, my second vote on that was, uh, by, I think, Ben Chavez Sr. And so uh, we held together two to one, Bill Vincent dissent, and the Supreme Court affirmed. And so that it was perfectly acceptable under the law to allow recovery, because this is where the damage was. It had nothing to do with the worth of the value of human life. It had to do with pure economics mm -hmm. here. And all you know, all this person had to do was reveal, confess the mistake, the error, and these people could have proceeded accordingly. So, yeah, Armijo versus the Board of Regents. That one sticks out. Sticks out. Remember Steve Berkovich came to the, the argument. Is that the Steve Berkovich argument? Where he, <laughs> <laughs> or is that another case? <laughs> I think that was another case. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> but maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it was certainly a, a unique, unique form of demonstrative evidence on the part of Mr. Yeah. Jerkovich. Mr. Jerkovich, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he was always a showman. That's an yeah. It's a fascinating case. It was a great case, and uh, yeah, yeah. allowed the uh, the rhetoric to soar a bit. Yeah, because uh, the majority opinion, the, the dissent accused us of devaluing human life, and I think it allowed us to say something like, "We bow to no one when it comes to respect for human life." There you are. This is the issue. There you are. So after 25 years, you retired. I did. Which is, it's been what, 10 years ago now? More, 14 years ago? Yeah. The years have slipped by. I mean, yeah, it's, a it's long amazing. Time. It's a long time. We tried to get this building built so you could spend some time here before yeah. you retired. Just, just missed couldn't it. quite make it. Just missed it. Just missed it, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, oh well, there you are, right? So what have you been doing in retirement? Not law, that much I know. Mm -hmm. You had not been doing law in your No, life. no. Oh. Um, right afterwards, I, uh, right after I retired, I did some hearing officer work. Um, <clears throat> when I was a student body vice president here at UNM, the president of the student body was a guy named Ron Curry. And when I retired from the bench, Ron was secretary of the environment. Huh? for the state. Right, 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 right. And so Ron appointed me hearing officer for the hearings uh, to determine whether Los Alamos 
and the WIP project. These are two separate cases, but uh, to get a renewed permit. Mm -hmm. And you're supposed to get that permit review, I believe, every 10 years. And for any number of reasons, Los Alamos had missed a cycle. So it had been 20 years since it, we, since it, their, their operation had been reviewed for compliance. Yeah, yeah. So I did that, and those were long hearings. There were weeks and weeks. And, and we went actually to the labs in Los Alamos. Most of them we held at the Santa Fe Community College. Uh, in Santa Fe, but so I did a lot. I did some of that stuff. <clears throat> Go to get uh, hooked by the Supremes to, uh, on occasion to do judicial conduct cases because I had been chair of judicial code of judicial conduct committee, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and was frequently a sub when one of them couldn't, which is routine, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and. Uh, and I became very involved in the administration and uh, governance of the, of the uh, Episcopal Church. And so, um, in fact, I still sit on their disciplinary board for bishops, and uh, which is probably only of interest to church geeks, but we actually have a, a board in which lay people sit to determine whether Bishop, bishops have engaged in misconduct, and they're elected by the National Convention um, for six-year terms. Yeah. I'm on my yeah. second six-year term. Wow. Probably the last. All lay people? Or no. Some clergy too? Majority bishops. Well, okay. Yeah, all right. But lay people. So. But lay people. Yeah. Great. And, a, and we have a, a kind of a settlement conference system and then an actual hearing mm -hmm. and at each on each of those there has to be at least one lay person yeah. yeah fascinating church governance my goodness church governance <laughs> it's great stuff very interesting stuff yeah and it's very i mean you know it, it's it's uh it mirrors the federal system in a sense that uh, most of those folks were involved in setting up this country and uh, uh, yeah. Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, uh, Hamilton, all those people wow. Wow. were also big shots in the Anglican Church. Right, 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 right. Which eventually became established here as the Episcopal Church. Yeah. There was a little problem in the ordination of clergy in the Anglican Church. That was you had to swear allegiance to the king. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> so, a little problem. Right? So, yeah, so the people, clergy locally uh, had a little trouble with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fascinating stuff. And that that's kind of kept me busy. I've not done anything much beyond Since that. So. so, as you look back on your life as a as a lawyer and a judge and and, and and religious administration too. That that's, that's a fascinating thing to do in your old age. If I belong to any church, I might do it. But, <laughs> but uh, uh, so, if any, anything popped to mind, anything that's that you really sort of says, "Wow, that was remarkable," or "Wow, that was a close call," or, "Wow," <laughs> any kind of wows. <laughs> Hmm. You know, I think, I don't know, well, two things. One is, with regard to the church stuff, to actually find, coming from the, the Roman Catholic background, um, finding that there was an institution that actually treated lay people as full participants and, and allowed you to, there's a house of deputies, which is lay people and uh, priests, and then there's a house of bishops. Mm -hmm. And just like in the federal system, any change to the canons or the constitution has to pass each house 
before it can be in exactly the same form before it can be adopted. Uh, wow. To me, that was wow, that's unheard of. I mean, yeah. You didn't wait for the archbishop to tell you what was happening. Archbishop had to go get the votes. Yeah, <laughs> uh, which was a difference. Oh. Um, hmm. Is that a carry? That's a carryover from the from the Jefferson Hamilton days, probably, right? I mean, probably. That, that, that's sort of because it sounds like close to the system, right? So, pretty interesting. Pretty close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. yeah but and the interesting thing was though the the, the 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 head of state was not made head of the church in the United States. Mm. Ah, right, 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 right. Right, exactly. Exactly. Oh. Yeah, That's separation. Separation, yeah. That's good. Hmm. And the second one? The second one, I think, is that um, um, serendipity of life. Mm. I mean, I never imagined that I would be in the judiciary. It wasn't a goal when I went to law school. Mm. I mean, I was gonna, that was going to be it, you know. Mm. Right. But practice law, whatever that meant. Yeah. Probably, um, probably uh, would have probably gotten sucked into the, uh, the legislature or the legislative stuff because I've always been interested in governance and how it works. Uh, uh, right. How that part of it works. Hmm. So you can thank Ray Showers for that, huh? Thank Ray Showers, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Ray. You know, Ray is, um, everybody needs t to have uh, somebody who always tells them the truth. Yeah, right, 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 right. And uh, Ray was my guy. Yeah. So I remember one time he picked up the phone and he said, Have you lost your mind? And I <laughs> not said, even hello. No, not <laughs> even hello. I said, Is that the same as hello? <laughs> and I don't remember what the case was, but it's something that. Yeah, so you're already on the bench at this point, right? Hell yeah. Yeah, okay. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Excellent stuff. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. That's great. Great stuff. Any regrets? You know, actually, no. Um, well, maybe that I didn't spend a little more time on the trial bench yeah, yeah. in terms of the career. Um, I like the trial bench. Yeah, yeah. It's a good thing you were able to adapt. No, because something like Pinch Neal, for example. Never. Yeah. He never adapted. He he quit and went back to being district judge. No. Yeah. 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 So, well, you, you know, you had good people around you. Tom Donnelly probably helped a lot. Didn't oh, Donnelly was great. Yeah. 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 He was great. And Tom's one of those people that I always wished I could be like Tom and that he um, be having conversation, casual conversation, which I usually had to come up to his office and interrupted him. Yeah. And he would pick up his pen and finish the word he was yeah. writing when I walked in. And he, he go. Right. Right. I mean, it would take me 15 minutes to settle down again. <laughs> Right, right, right. But, uh, yeah. Before you close the door, he was back. Yeah. It's good. You know, he was good, uh, a good influence. Henley was a good influence. Mm -hmm. um, different different kind of guys, but bottom line folks in the sense of, we just got to decide this. Right, right, right. right um, exactly. Not agonized over and forever and ever. <clears throat> and uh, Frank Allen on the district bench. Classic. He was so good. Probably yeah. Was so good. You, you know, know, I was probably the last person to see him alive. Astonishingly enough, it, 
I shouldn't intervene like this, but I gave him a ride home from Conclave uh -huh. on a Friday afternoon, and he died that, that afternoon. Oh, wow. Yeah. But, uh, anyway, so. Frank, yeah, Frank was, uh, yeah, so the only thing, the only mean thing he ever did <laughs> was one time we were at a, an event of some sort that was, I believe, being held at John Brennan's house in Old Town, in uh, the country club, yep, yep, yep. Grandma McKenna's house. And uh, Donnelly and Alan are across the way, and De Alan, I go over, uh, as, since I'd been summoned, and uh, I said, what, what's up? He said, oh, nothing. Tom and I just wanted a short person to make fun of. <laughs> I thought that was mean. <laughs> Happy to accommodate him. <laughs> That's great. That's excellent. They were, it's, it's good stuff. Yeah. Anything else you want to say? That's a pretty good place to stop, actually. <laughs> Tom <laughs> Donnelly and Speedy Allen have a little fun at your expense. It's a pretty good place to stop, isn't it? That's Unless, a good place to stop. You got more? Stop. You want to talk more? No, not particularly. No. But I'm willing to what? Whatever. Whatever. Oh, I have to say I'm getting tired. You can just splice this at the end. Right, 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 right. Well, thank you, Joe. Sure, and, and, thank and, you. And before we actually cut it, let, let me give you my, my, my own personal thank you, because when I came on this court, even though I've been practicing 20 years, I was pretty damn green, man, I'm telling you. And so the, the amount of time that you allowed me to spend in your office figuring out how to do the job was absolutely uh, uh, priceless, I mean, and necessary, too. So anyway, I've, thank you on the record. For, for all that. It was great. Always a pleasure. Anyway. Always a pleasure. It's good. All right, Guy. Excellent. Thanks. Sure. It was nice. It's great.